All right, welcome to week four, video 11. This uh, video is on Iris Marion Young's essay, Five Faces of Oppression. This is a very famous essay. It's taught often in undergraduate philosophy and political science classes. And I really like it. I think this is a really important essay because it, um, well, so much of the time when we talk about political oppression, we focus on a single group that's being oppressed by another group, right? So we might talk about the oppression of women or the oppression of African Americans, or we might go over to China and talk about the oppression of the Uyghurs by the Han Chinese, right? Um, and so what we're always doing is looking at a particular place and time, in particular groups, and all these things work differently. Um, so it's hard to uh, get a, a big picture. And so what Young is doing here that I think is really good is um, not looking at individual cases of oppression, but mechanisms of oppression that can be applied across cases. And then this also becomes really useful because um, you can then apply it to any situation you're looking at where there is oppression going on and see the different mechanisms at work. And then I think the other really great thing is that I think she's identified the right five faces. Um, so uh, I, in this video, I'm going to talk about her uh, introduction where she frames how her project, and then I'm going to run through um, the, uh, the five faces and highlight important parts about them. And then in uh, the class, your job is going to be to apply these ideas to situations that we have been reading about. All right. So the first thing to note is that Young views oppression as a structural concept. And this relates back to the previous essay we read by her, her other most famous essay, um, political responsibility and structural injustice. Her focus always is not on individuals and um, the suffering that they might undergo because of injustice, but on the larger social structures that create that. Um, so she just starts out by, well, we ordinarily think of oppression as involving dictators. All of our Hollywood images of oppression looks at dictatorships, whether it's their real dictatorships like Nazi Germany or imagined dictatorships like the Empire and Star Wars, right? And then you've got a single individual who is the villain, the Hitler, the Darth Vader, that sort of thing. Um, in the real world, uh, that dictators exist, dictators oppress, but um, ordinary practices of everyday life can also be oppressive. So what she says is that the systematic character of oppression implies that the oppressed group need not have a correlate oppressing group. That is, you don't need to have straightforward villains here. You could just have a society that is ordered wrong. Another thing that's good is that this is a corrective to, I think, a lot of, uh, well, to, to Marxist uh, understandings of oppression, which have dominated a lot of people's thinking for a very long time. Um, so Marxists attempt to reduce all kinds of oppression to class struggle. Um, and the failure of this effort means, shows that we cannot grant any single form of oppression primacy. We're dealing with a complicated system where many different people suffer injustice in many different ways. You can't reduce it down to a single thing. So we have to acknowledge multiple modes of oppression and their uh, intersectionality. And then we get the big claim. Um, I think this is uh, this would count as the thesis of her essay. And uh, it's actually really quite ambitious, but I think it's correct. The five modes of oppression here are adequate to describe the oppression of any group. 
So we want to talk about the concept of a social group here. This is important. In the previous essay in um, structural uh, political responsibility and structural injustice, she looked at she she talked about the idea of a social structure, and we gave a rough sense of what a social structure was. We used examples like McDonald's and LCCC to show um, uh, what what she's talking about. Because again, it is the social structure that is the focus of analysis here. Okay, so um, now instead of talking about social structures, we're talking about social groups, which are related, but different. So to start with, um, we're, the, the idea of a social group is meant to capture um, what we think of when we think of things like racism or sexism or ableism, right? That is prejudice against the disabled. Um, so uh, that is a, a social group is going to be a group like um, a race or a gender or an ethnicity or a religious group, but we're going to try and generalize it past that point. To start with, we are not going to talk about any arbitrary collection of people, right? I mean, you can identify a group left-handed dentists, right? But that is not left hand all left-handed dentists aren't going to form a social group because that's not bound up in people's self-understanding. The first thing we need to understand is that social groups are identity groups. Um, when people, when they think of themselves, think of themselves as belonging to this group. Social groups are defined relative to other social groups. Um, that is, uh, when we identify a group, an in-group, we're also identifying an out-group. So if we identify women as a social group, we also have to identify men or perhaps non-women. You know, there are going to be situations where there are multiple groups in a single category. But at the very least, we always need to have, be able to create some kind of contrast. Social groups have cultural forms, practices, and way of life, ways of life. They're going to play certain roles in the kinds of social structures that we talked about in the previous essay. Right? So again, these aren't random collections of people or collections of people brought together under any arbitrary principle. These are um, groups that have certain ways of acting in common. Traditional political theory has not talked about social groups. Traditional political theory has been focused on, for the most part, governments and contracts. And um, in that, they've only been dealing with sort of random collections of people, um, or perhaps not random collections of people, but there's no, there's no worry about what ties the people together other than the uh, possibility of a hypothetical social contract. But the thing is, contracts really only work for uh, arbitrary groups. They don't work for social groups where they're built out of people's sense of self-identity. So the thing to see here is that um, oppression is going to necessarily relate to the concept of a social group. So uh, oppression is always about the relationship between um, two or more social groups. Um, oh, uh, last point was, was about traditional uh, political theory. Traditional political theory is atomist and individualist. You can read more about this in the essay, but this is, again, just contrasting her approach with the contract-based approach that mo mostly focuses on the role of government. All right, so now we get the five faces. Exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. Um, and so these terms are now all going to be used in from here on out in a fairly technical fashion. Um, that is, when we talk about exploitation, 
we're going to be using the word specifically the way Jung thinks of it, even though, and that has some relationship to the, our ordinary concept of um, uh, exploitation, but where by using the refined concept, we focus on particular ideas about exploitation. And just actually a quick example for uh, how technical terms work here, it, it can come if we skip down to violence, right? Ordinarily, we think of violence as any case where one person punches another person in the face, for instance. Um, but if I just run around punching people at random, that's not violence in the sense that Jung is using it, because for Jung, oppression is always a relationship between groups. So violence here is um, violence directed at individuals because they belong to a group. We'll get to that last. Let's talk about exploitation first. So again, Jung here is working in contrast with uh, older Marxist theories. Older Marxist theories began with the assumption um, that all oppression is essentially the oppression of the working class. It's all about uh, the, the oppression of labor and the proletariat. And this oppression consists in the fact that, um, well, as it's put here, um, some people exercise their capacities uh, under the control according to the purposes and for the benefit of other people. So what does that mean? Exer let's start with exercise their capacities. Uh, <laughs> We're human beings, we're capable of doing things, we're capable of building bridges, or making Zoom videos, or sitting around and talking. Uh, these are things we do. Under capitalism, these activities become labor. Um, and when they're labor, they're directed by, under the control of your boss, for the purpose of your boss, and for the benefit of your boss. And this is true whether you're building bridges, or um, making videos to show on the internet, or just talking on a talk show. All of this becomes labor done for the benefit of a boss. Uh, one of the many limitations of this theory, of the Marxist theory of exploitation, is that it can't account for um, labor that takes place outside of formal capitalist markets. So the big critique here came from feminists who said that the Marxist theory of exploitation didn't account for the way that women can be exploited by men in, for instance, um, domestic labor. In domestic labor, you know, women do the housework under the traditional conception of the family, and so they're performing tasks uh, quote, for someone that, that on whom they are dependent. Um, so it still has a lot of the structure of the Marxist theory of exploitation, but it's not a part of uh, a capitalist market. So what Jung does is she brings this together and says the central insight in the concept of exploitation then is that oppression occurs through the steady stream and transfer of the results of labor from one social group to benefit another. Let's continue on with that. Um, injustices of exploitation cannot be eliminated by the redistribution of goods, for as long as institutional processes and structured relations remain unaltered, the process of transfer will recreate the unequal distribution of events, uh, of, of benefits. So basically, Exploitation happens when some people are doing the work and the benefits of that work don't go to the people doing the work. They are systematically channeled to another group of people. So that can, we, can, we can give a, a, a more official definition here. Exploitation is the steady and systematic transfer of the results of labor from one social group to another. Exploitation, though, isn't the only way people wind up being oppressed. 
Exploitation fundamentally only applies to people who are doing some form of work, either in the formal labor force or the informal domestic labor force. Let's think about people who don't work. Marginalization. Marginalization, marginals are the people that the system of labor cannot or will not use. Marginalization is perhaps the most dangerous form of oppression. A whole category of people is expelled from useful participation in social life and thus potentially subjected to severe material deprivation and even extermination. Think about societies where certain classes of people are pure non-entities. For instance, um, uh, the, right now in Burma, there is the systematic uh, genocide, actually, of Muslims at the hand of, of Buddhists. Um, you may think of Buddhists as peaceful people, but every religion winds up having its militant side. So um, the Buddhist majority is, ha, treats the Rohingya Muslims as marginals. They're, they aren't citizens. They aren't part of the society. They aren't part of the system of labor. They are completely external. Um, and in the end, there's nothing to be done with them besides extermination. So marginalization is important as a prelude, particularly to gen genocide. So we're just going to call marginalization the oppression felt by people whose labor society cannot or will not use. Um, and Young has some examples of this, um, and you should go and look at her examples to get a specific understanding of what she means. And then you could, should also be able to think of examples from the other forms, uh, from the other readings that you've done. Powerlessness. Again, in ordinary speech, you might think of power, any, anytime someone is oppressed, they are powerless. But um, is specific, she means something more specific by this. And she actually, it's easiest here to start with her example rather than uh, her definition. Um, not, her example is non-professional labor. Not, uh, that is, so a professional labor is typically white collar work, um, work where you have to dress up and you get a lot of autonomy. Non-professional labor would be something where you're paid by the hour and wear a uniform. Um, Non-professionals suffer a form of oppression in addition to exploitation, which I call powerless, powerlessness. Most people in these societies do not regularly participate in making decisions that affect the conditions of their lives and actions in this sense. And, uh, and in this sense, most people lack significant power. The question is about, ultimately, workplace autonomy. When you go to work, do you just basically do what someone else tells you to do? Non-professionals, for the most part, work in jobs where you show up to work um, and someone else tells you what to do. You ring people up, you restock the shelves, you change the bedpans, that sort of thing. Um, and again, this is typically uh, labor that's paid by the hour, and it is labor that uh, uh, where you wear some kind of uniform, that sort of thing. Um, professionals, on the other hand, have a lot of workplace autonomy. Being a college professor is a, a, a professional job. That is, I get to control all sorts of things about what I do, so I, I'm not oppressed in this sense at all. Um, and in general, people who um, work in offices and make decisions are, you know, have autonomy. They have power. So we can generalize this and say that oppression is, uh, powerlessness is the oppression that is felt by people who are not allowed to participate meaningfully in the decisions that affect their lives. Who is a decision maker? I, maybe in your workplace or any other aspect of your life. If you're not making the decisions, if you don't have a voice in the decisions, then you are 
um, you are you suffer powerlessness. I should note that um, when we our canonical vision of oppression, where it's oppression is something that a dictator has, a dictator does, like the Kim family in North Korea. Um, ultimately, the people who suffer under them suffer from powerlessness. Dictators are, dictatorships are not democratic societies, and because they're not democratic, the people do not have a say in making the decisions of the society. So a lot of what we ordinarily think of as Hollywood oppression um, would fall under the category of powerlessness. You have a dictator who makes decisions and people who do not have a voice in the fundamental choices that affect the course of their lives. Cultural imperialism is an interesting and subtle one, and often this becomes a subject of a lot of huge debates because it's sufficiently subtle that people don't always realize what's going on. Um, it's easiest to think of this actually again in terms of Hollywood movies, though. Hollywood movies present do, um, standard stories that everyone recognizes, right? And, or uh, TV shows, cop shows, right? Uh, a police procedural shows the police um, as the good guys who um, use rational methods to uncover the real person who, who uh, committed a crime and then punish them, right? So these become the, the dominant meanings of society. These are the perspectives that are reflected in most cultural products. Um, and so often also TV shows have in the past um, only reflected the perspectives of white men. Um, when you don't see yourself or your experience reflected in the dominant cultural products, you are a victim of cultural imperialism. Um, your own group and your own group's experience is invisible. Um, and at the same time, you are stereotyped and one's group is marked out as other. So we're going to say cultural imperialism is the oppression that comes from not having your perspective represented in the system of communication of society. So if your experience of the police does not resemble the, your experience of the police on TV, that's a form of cultural imperialism because your perspective in life um, in which the police are perhaps not heroes that rationally find the right person and put them in jail, um, isn't reflected in the, the images that run a society. All right, so the last one is violence. Um, and again, uh, violence is being used in a specific sense here. What makes violence a face of oppression is less the particular acts themselves though these are often horrible, than the social context surrounding them, which makes them possible and even acceptable. So again, we're not just talking about any old case where one person hits another person in the face or stabs them in the back or uh, shoots them while they are running away, right? These are all things that are horrible, but they become oppression in Jung's sense when they are in a certain social context um, that makes them possible or even acceptable. So what makes the phenomenon of, uh, uh, of violence a social injustice and not merely an individual wrong is its systematic character, its existence in a social practice. I should note here that she's not denying that individual wrongs are real, right? I mean, if I decide to arbitrarily punch someone in the face, that's an act of violence, and that is an individual wrong. But that is not a structural or systemic wrong, which is her focus there. So, violence. Systematic physical harm directed to members of a group because they are members of a group. Pretty straightforward, really. So, um... Uh, you know, back in the 90s, there was a lot of publicity around gay bashing where, where 
people would just get beaten up for being obviously gay in public. And this still happens, um, but it was a big uh, subject of social concern. Um, and uh, this is what we would call violence as a form of oppression, right? Um, you can also think about um, homeless people are often targets for violence. Anyone who's marked out as someone who can't fight back is going to be someone who's targeted for violence. Uh, women walking alone, that sort of thing. Okay, so those are our five faces and the sort of the context of why she wants to highlight these five faces of oppression. So your task is going to be to look at her examples and also examples in the readings that we've been doing. And I think, I hope what you'll find is that these are really flexible concepts that, uh, where you can just look at individual situations and say, oh my gosh, yes, this, th this fits this description perfectly. And hopefully that will then give you some a philosophical insight into uh, the injustices that we are studying.